the kingdoms of the Deccan, Vijayanagar, Krishna Raya, a medieval metropolis, laws, arts, religion, tragedy. As the Muslims advanced into India, native culture receded farther and farther south, and towards the end of these Middle Ages, the finest achievements of Hindu civilization were those of the Deccan. For a time, the Chalyuka tribe maintained an independent kingdom reaching across central India and achieved, under Pulakeshin II, sufficient power and glory to defeat Harsha, to attract Yuan Shuang, and to receive a respectable embassy from Koshru II of Persia. It was in Pulakeshin's reign and territory that the greatest of Indian paintings, the frescoes of Ajanta, were completed. Pulakeshin was overthrown by the king of the Pallavas, who, for a brief period, became the supreme power in central India. In the extreme south, and as early as the first century of after Christ, the Pandyas established a realm comprising Madura, Tinevali, and parts of Travancore. They made Madura one of the finest of medieval Hindu cities, and adorned it with a gigantic temple and a thousand lesser works of architectural art. In their turn, they too were overthrown, first by the Kolas, then by the Mohammedans. The Kolas ruled the region between Madura and Madras, and thence westward to Mysore. They were of great antiquity, being mentioned in the edicts of Ashoka, but we know nothing of them until the 9th century, when they began a long career of conquest that brought them tribute from all southern India, even from Ceylon. Then their power waned, and they passed under the control of the greatest of the southern states via Vijayanagar. In this medley of now almost forgotten kingdoms, there were periods of literary and artistic, above all architectural, creation. There were wealthy capitals, luxurious palaces, and mighty potentates. But so vast is India? and so long its history that in this congested paragraph we must pass by without so much as mentioning them, men who for a time thought they dominated the earth. For example, Vrikra Maditya, who ruled the Chalyukans for half a century, 1076 to 1126, was so successful in war that, like Nietzsche, he proposed to found a new chronological era, dividing all history into before him and after him. Today, he is a footnote. Vijayanagar, the name both of a kingdom and of its capital, is a melancholy instance of forgotten glory. In the years of its grandeur, it comprised all the present native states of the Lower Peninsula together with Mysore and the entire presidency of Madras. We may judge of its power and resources by considering that King Krishna Raya led forth to battle at Tilikota, 703,000 foot, 32,600 horse, 551 elephants, and some 100,000 merchants, prostitutes, and other camp followers such as were then wont to accompany an army in its campaigns. The autocracy of the king was softened by a measure of village autonomy and by the occasional appearance of an enlightened and human monarch on the throne. Krishna Raya, who ruled Vijayanagar in the days of Henry VIII, compares favorably with that constant lover. He led a life of justice and courtesy, gave abounding alms, tolerated all Hindu faiths enjoyed and supported literature and the arts, forgave fallen enemies and spared their cities, and devoted himself sedulously to the chores of administration. A Portuguese missionary, Domingos Pais, 1522, describes him as the most feared and perfect king that could possibly be. 
cheerful of disposition and very merry. He is one that seeks to honor foreigners and receives them kindly. He is a great ruler and a man of much justice, but sudden subject to sudden fits of rage. He is by rank a greater lord than any by reason of what he possesses in armies and territories. But it seems that he is in fact nothing compared to what a man like him ought to have. So gallant and perfect is he in all things. Among these modest possessions so described were 12,000 wives. The capital, founded in 1336, was probably the richest city that, city that India had yet known. Niccolo Conti, visiting it about 1420, estimated its circumference at 60 miles. Pais pronounced it as large as Rome and very beautiful to the sight. There were, he added, many groves of trees within it and many conduits of water. For its engineers had constructed a huge dam in the Tangubhadra River and it formed a reservoir from which water was conveyed to the city by an aqueduct 15 miles long, cut for several miles out of the solid rock. Abduar Razak, who saw the city in 1443, reported it as such that eye has not seen nor ear heard of any place resembling it upon the whole earth. Pais considered it the best provided city in the world for in this one, everything abounds. The houses, he tell us, numbered over a hundred thousand, implying a population of half a million souls. He marvels at a palace in which one room was built entirely of ivory. It is so rich and beautiful that you would hardly find an anywhere another such. When Firoz Shah, Sultan of Delhi, married the daughter of Vijayanagar's king in the latter's capital, the road was spread for six miles with velvet, satin, cloth of gold, and other costly stuffs. However, every traveler is a liar. Underneath this wealth, a population of serfs and laborers lived in poverty and superstition, subject to a code of laws that preserved some commercial morality by a barbarous severity. Punishments ranged from mutilation of hands or feet to casting a man to the elephants, cutting off his head, impaling him alive by a stake thrust through his belly, or hanging him on a hook under his chin until he died. Rape as well as large-scale theft was punished in this last way. Prostitution was permitted, regulated, and turned into royal revenue. Opposite the mint, says Abduar Raza, is the office of the prefect of the city, to which it is said 12,000 policemen are attached, and their pay is derived from the proceeds of the brothels. The splendor of these houses, the beauty of the heart ravishers, their blanchments and ogles are beyond all description. Women were of subject status, and were expected to kill themselves on the deaths of their husbands sometimes by allowing themselves to be buried alive. Under the Rayas, or kings of Vijayanagar, literature prospered, both in classical Sanskrit and in the Telugu dialect of the South. Krishna Raya was himself a poet, as well as a liberal patron of letters, and his poet laureate, Alasani Padana, is ranked among the highest of India's singers. Painting and architecture flourished, Enormous temples were built, and almost every foot of their surface was carved into statuary or bas-relief. Buddhism had lost its hold, and a form of Brahmanism that especially honored Vishnu had become the faith of the people. The cow was holy and was never killed, but many species of fowl and cattle were sacrificed to the gods and eaten by the people. Religion was brutal and manners were refined. In one day, all this power and luxury were destroyed. Slowly, the conquering Muslims had made their way south. Now the sultans of Bujapur, Ahmadanagar, Golconda, 
in Bidar united their forces to reduce this last stronghold of the native Hindu kings. Their combined armies met Ramaraja's half million men at Talikota. The superior numbers of the attackers prevailed. Ramaraja was captured and beheaded in the sight of his followers, and these, losing courage, fled. Nearly a hundred thousand of them were slain in the retreat, until all the streams were colored with their blood. The conquering troops plundered the wealthy capital and found the booty so abundant that every private man in the allied army became rich in gold, jewels, tents, effects, arms, horses, and slaves. For five months, the plunder continued. The victors slaughtered the helpless inhabitants in indiscriminate butchery, emptied the stores and shops, smashed the temples and palaces, and labored at great pains to destroy all the painting and statuary in the city. Then they went through the streets with flaming torches and set fire to all that would burn. When at last they were tired, Vijayanagar was as completely ruined as if an earthquake had visited it, and had left not a stone upon a stone. It was a destruction ferocious and absolute, typifying that terrible Muslim conquest of India which had begun a thousand years before and was now complete.